Um, so <clears throat> we've got what about eight minutes to do this. So what I want to do is um, we have a really cool, what we think is a really cool demo for you. Uh, but first, I want to take just a couple of minutes to have the context for what we're doing. My name is uh, Christopher Nguyen. I am the co-founder and CEO of, of Adetao. Uh, at one point, I was uh, engineering director at Google, um, working on Google Apps. Uh, with me here is Mike Bui. He's also co-founder of Adetao, uh, PhD, UIUC in computer science. And uh, most recently, Michael was uh, with uh, Yahoo working Hadoop 2.0. Okay. So as you can see here, our company vision is about data intelligence for all. And in the near term, the term for all for us means business users, data scientists, as well as data engineers. Now, when we talk to customers in the enterprise, and that's, that's the target market, we're seeing a very definite trend of convergence. Um, and it's driven largely by big data. So you see a convergence between big data and big compute. In fact, that's what Spark really is, right? It brings big compute to big data, and so you can get intelligence. Uh, but you also see a convergence between business intelligence and data science, right? So no, no longer are you seeing in the enterprise users that are on the business side and they have, you know, use Excel exclusively for their BI work, or data scientists on the other side using R and R Studio for data science work. People are starting to say, you know, can I have a unified platform for doing um, the data analytics. And more subtly, I think this is the underlying trend is that you're seeing a convergence of essentially our thought stream, the human intelligence side, with the data stream, that is machine intelligence. And I, this is a really a, so in, in that sense, I really believe that big data in the near term is, you know, a lot of people think it's overhyped, but like the internet in the long term is really underhyped. Uh, so a data tower sits right at the intersection of this convergence. So you see that our product is what we, we position as one unified workbench for collaborative intelligence. And we'll show you what we mean by that. Now, so we have, essentially, this is the whole architecture of the product. You've got the beauty layer and the power layer. Uh, above it, you have something called P Insights. P stands for predictive. P Insights is the layer that the user interacts with. There's a web interface, RStudio, if the, if the user's like that, Python, and so on, various uh, shell interfaces. That's the layer that exposes the beauty of the product, the front end uh, to the user. But that layer is nothing without the power underneath, and which what we call P analytics. And Spark is wrapped inside of this. So P analytics is that layer that moves massive amounts of data in seconds. So between that, it, it, it allows very, a lot of fluidity so that the user can interact with the data in a very or organic, natural, thought stream kind of way. So without further ado, we're going to get into the demo. Um, so today's demo, we're using an eight-node cluster, very, very small. Um, it has a master and eight workers. And we're, for the data, we're using uh, at the airline data set, the classic airline data set. How many people here know about the airline data set? OK. So it's about 12 gig of, of, uh, mem uh, of data, 123 million rows of flight data in the US between 1988 and 2008, and it has information like flight delay and, and so on. All right, so then, you know, in the interest of time, if you remember nothing else about uh, my demo, just remember this one thing, uh, we're hiring. <laughs> I, have, I have to get that in. All right, so go ahead and. OK, all right. We're, we're fighting on. Who gets the space? <laughs> All right. So what you're seeing here, OK, is the front end of the uh, Data P, uh, P Insights. So the, the model that we have is a very fluid document model. You're seeing basically things that look like Google Docs, which I was associated with, or it could be Microsoft Office 365. Um, the really interesting thing is, of course, you go in here and you can create images and text and everything else, but it, this has some secret powers. And Mike is going to show you some secret power, which is the ability to do embedded analytics right inside the document on big data. OK. So could you scoot over a little? I have to speak into this. All right. OK, 
Okay, so what Mike is doing is just creating a normal document. Okay, so there's a title to it. Maybe say hello to people, All right? All right. Now the interesting thing is this document is connected to the cluster that is mentioned. And that cluster has data in it, the airline data set. So with a single command, uh, Mike is going to connect to that data set. Okay, so that flight info data set. And by the way, you can see some of this stuff here called DDF. We'll talk more about DDF at the, the sort of the under layer of this in the, this afternoon's uh, presentation. A very interesting architecture. So once you have that, there's this interface called Smart Query that we have essentially it's a natural language interface. It understands the commands that you are uh, giving to it. It also understands the schema of the data underneath. So very fluidly, the user can type and very much like a Facebook search, you know, they can interact with the data. Right, so here, that, that happened in real time. Mike just did a aggregation of uh, arrival delay by month. So as you expect, you can see that uh, December, because of all the holidays, has a lot more delays, and also the summer months, June, July, and so on, August, right? So this interface is, is very, very easy to use. You start just typing a few things, and you know, the system essentially just helps you along. So next, you're going to do... Day of week. Okay, okay. Well, he's going to do the same aggregation, but by day of week. And uh, sure enough, you see that Friday is the worst day to fly, okay? And then Saturday is, is the best day to fly in terms of delay. Okay, so that, again, that aggregation took place in the cluster over 124 million rows or so in, in seconds, thanks to the p analytic engine with Spark underneath. Um, How about uh, Blender? Okay, uh, yeah, so... Heat map. Okay, so this is a heat map of cancellation frequency over the 20-year period. So with this, at a glance, you can see, well, there's a lot of... It's going to take a lot, yeah, two minutes. Okay, yeah. well, it's done. Um, so here you can see, for example, 2001, right, 9-11, there's a lot of cancellation right after the event. So at a glance, you can see all of this. Uh, very fluid interaction with the big data underneath and very easy sets of commands. Uh, and of course, we also support other uh, languages like R, SQL, and so on. You'll see that a little bit. Uh, but here, with a single click, Mike is going to go and say, view this whole thing as a dashboard. So this is what we think dashboard creation should be, right? You should be querying this, the engine and then say, okay, show me the dashboard version of that, right? You can move that around. Okay, cool. So next, I guess we should show, I should get my laptop. All right. Uh, I hope I can get this done right. Okay, so uh, suppose Mike is some business user who needs to do some kind of advanced analysis that isn't you know, sort of out of reach of this uh, smart query language. And so he can bring me in. Okay. okay. So what's the document? Flight info? Yeah. Okay. So you probably want to bring my screen up. Yeah. Okay. So we have screen sharing, so we can show that on, on there. Somehow you've got to be able to move that down. Yeah. Mm. Okay, how about that? Move it down. Okay. So all the way down. I can't see it now. Let's plug it back in. No, no, not all the way down. Go up. Okay, there we go. Okay, can you move me back up? Yeah. All right, so there I am. Okay, I should... Okay, I'm gonna go into the flight info document. Right. No, app spotlight. No, okay. All right, so can you see my screen there? I guess you can sort of see it. Let me zoom in. Okay, so I am the one on the upper right, and Mike's document is there. Okay. So I can see the document that Mike was just working on. Okay, and he's asking me something here. Okay, so CTN. Okay, you can see. Yep, you can see my screen as well, and I can say, hey, I can help you with that. Just watch. Okay, and within the same document, I can, you know, well, let me try to get the command to help you with.
Okay, did you read no. that already? No. All right. Yeah. All right, so you can see, can you zoom in so the, we can see what's going on on your screen? Okay, so that I just typed in in real time. And then, okay, I'm gonna switch over to R and then run the analysis on his behalf. And then, boom, both of us can see what's going on there. Okay, so that's something that I just collaborated with Mike on. All right. Okay, cool. So what do you have to do show next? Uh, okay, so next we want to show you, I remember, uh, <laughs> machine learning. All right. So Mike is going to switch over to R mode in this case, and he's going to build a model of the same data set. <coughs> okay. So you're actually, he's actually working on the exact same data set in the same document uh, in real time. He's not switching to uh, a, a different you know, R engine. Okay. And those of you, how many people know R? Okay. <clears throat> how many of you see that this is exactly the R that you are familiar with? Right? Okay. I think this is really, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so Mike is doing that. I'm also seeing over here. Right? So this is the exact sort of syntax that you're familiar with in R. And it's done, however, in the Spark system. Right? The P Analytics and the Apache Spark system underneath. So we hide all the complexity of programming in MapReduce or even in, in Spark API from the R user so that you can be really, really productive quite fluidly. Okay. So he just built that model over 124 million rows in real time. And okay, so he just did a plotting of true values versus predicted values. Okay? That's it. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, cool. Awesome. All right, so we only have so much time. Uh, if you want to know how we actually built this, uh, the, there's a, something very interesting called distributed data frame uh, that we're make, going to make some interesting announcement on this afternoon. So c come see that talk. All right. All right. So apparently I was also wrong. So the soccer game starts at one, but we're getting in the way of something more powerful. Oh, Lunch okay. is at 12, so we stop people from getting food. <laughs> um, so we'll try to uh, let them go get it. So uh, Christopher, question for you, right? I mean, and you wrote a blog post. Uh, you know, if you guys hadn't had a chance to read it, you should definitely go read it. You guys made a bet on Spark from the beginning. Um, so I'm curious kind of if you could you know, summarize what was the reason for that? And if you had to go back and do it differently, are there lessons you learned for people who are starting now with Spark that you would say, do these differently? I learned when I was going through it. Uh, well, uh, I, I guess the, sh the TLDR version is read the blog entry. <laughs> um, but there were a couple of things that, uh, that made us bet on Spark. So this was early 2012. Um, uh, in fact, the short version of it is a, a day how actually we set out to build something like Spark. Right, because we wanted to solve what, we, what I call the map reduce problem, or more specifically, the hive problem. Um, and we took a look at all of the in-memory architectures from there. I knew from Google, uh, using things like Dremel and, and so on, that that has to be sort of the, the, the initial premise. Uh, now, not all in-memory architectures are the same thing. So when we took a look at Spark, along with all of the other approaches about, you know, that, that use in-memory, uh, they're not all the same, and Spark essentially, in a word, you know, did the right thing. Uh, had the right architecture, had to solve the right problem. And so uh, equally importantly, and I think this is what I've learned, I've built companies, uh, you know, even before joining Google, um, timing is everything, you know, in life as well as is in business. Um, I had the opportunity to sit at the front row dealing with uh, Wall Street, um, uh, essentially computing, uh, statistical arbitrage trading system back in the early 2000s, and saw this transition of traditional computing into in-memory computing. And the reason for that is the cost curve of RAM keeps going down, exactly Moore's law. And when the value of that exceeds the cost, then people will switch over. So that happened on Wall Street first. And then around 2007, 2008, it happened on a larger scale at Google. And so if you just draw that curve, you know exactly 2012, 13 is about the right time when RAM is about you know, three gigabyte, uh, or $3 per gigabyte today. So, so Spark is very well designed. And it came onto the scene at just the right time. And so those two reasons coming together just made it actually a pretty simple bet. And then uh, another question. I mean, you guys have obviously built a lot on top of the uh, Spark. And I know you'll talk about later today the DDFs um, and, and that capability you guys have designed. I'm, I'm curious, 
what do you look at kind of if you were to pick your, I guess I asked everybody, the wish list of the two or three things that you would love to see this added to Spark? It would basically enable, you know, the community to be even farther a year from now. Uh, what is it? You know, what would you put on that roadmap? Um, I guess three things, right? Um, first is a lot of the obvious stuff that we as, you know, we are the application of Spark and we see this need all the time. Uh, essentially, the enterpriceification, if you will, I can make up a word, of Spark. Uh, security, scalability, monitoring, management, and so on. There's so much work that can be done there to essentially make sure that Spark is the platform of choice when people make a bet about what comp big compute engine they're going to be betting on. So I think Spark has a great start, but I think there's a lot of work that we all can, can contrib to contribute to. Um, the, the second thing is a personal passion of mine. Uh, something, you know, deep learning. I'm really very excited about it. And those of you on the other side of the machine learning fans, please give me the benefit of the doubt that I'm excited about it in a sophisticated way. <laughs> uh, not from the New York Times uh, article and so on. Um, but I think Spark is actually very well positioned to add certain primitives around, uh, for example, the neural uh, model, right? There's local compute between, uh, local communication between nodes. And so there, there can be additional communication primitives around uh, support for deep learning in the Spark ecosystem. And I guess the last thing further out is I'm actually also very excited about Tachyon. Right? Now Tachyon today is positioned as, as you all know, memory-based file system. But I think actually Tachyon has opportunity to be, opportunity to be much, much bigger than that. Uh, what's happening in the data center is that the network, tr uh, network fabric is getting a lot faster. right? Um, in the next generation, we're going to be going from f 50 microsecond to 5 microsecond latency. So when that happens, it's going to be a lot faster for me uh, on one node to reach out to your memory on the other node than even to go to SSD, which is approaching uh, 30 microsecond. All right. So when if that happens, if it's tach tachyon, it's going to be some other engine that's going to give us this distributed memory, you know, truly a warehouse scale computer, which is already happening at Google. And I think Tachyon and Spark have, a, have an excellent opportunity, very, very well positioned to take the lead in that. Um, and one last question for you again, because you guys have been using Spark. We have a ton of people here who are interested in Spark, figuring out how to get started. And at the beginning, if you were to give you know, kind of two pieces of advice to somebody who's just starting out with Spark, uh, what would it be? Okay, I, I guess I can only, <laughs> I don't mean to be so self-obsessed, but I can only think of one. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that's, uh, there are um, obviously there are lots of experience and things that we can learn, so it's hard to rank. Uh, but but one thing I would strongly recommend is you look at uh, there's there's a problem that we're trying to solve for uh, big data as a whole is that it's actually still too 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 complicated, right? From the top down view, I as a user want to see the big data world as one big table, right? And I should be able to do various things with that table. Uh, so we're working on something called distributed data frame. Last time when we did the presentation. Uh, people were asking, how do we do all this R stuff? And we said, well, there's this thing. And so we've sort of fact refactored all of that into something called distributed airframe. So that may be one very good API for you to look at in terms of being very, very productive on building uh, analytic applications on top of you know, very large scale systems. And th the talk is this afternoon. Christopher, thank you. Pleasure as always. Thank you, guys. Andy, here you go.